yes, I identify as a European. And I will say I identify as a European in two ways. One, culturally, uh, and uh, because uh, I feel Portuguese, uh, I feel part of my family too, but I also feel European. The extent to which uh, these uh, forms of identity are stronger or more visible to me uh, depends on the context where I am. Uh, uh, when I'm in another European country, perhaps I feel a little bit more Portuguese. Uh, when I'm in another continent, I feel a little bit more European, for example. But I also feel European, not only in terms of a cultural identity, uh, because of aspects that I share with other Europeans that become more visible precisely when I'm in a country that is not European. I also feel European in a political sense, in the sense that I believe that a lot of the policies that determine my life today uh, are not only decided at European Union level, but need to be decided at European Union level. The extent of economic and social interdependence that we have today requires for uh, a lot of aspects of my life to be regulated uh, at a level that transcends my uh, nation state. And that level is the European Union level. Uh, and that makes me feel European in this, to the extent that I believe that I need to find the ways to participate and shape those policies at the European Union level. So increasingly, I feel the need to be a political actor, politically active also at European uh, level, and I feel European also in that way. For me, it, it will have to be um, the moment or the years that I spent at the European University Institute in Florence doing my PhD. Uh, I did my PhD in a genuinely European uh, environment because it was a European um, research and higher education institution uh, that has uh, students doctoral students there, because there's only masters and, and, and PhDs, uh, but doctoral students that come, came from all European uh, member states, and also professors that came from all European member states. So that created a genuinely European intellectual community. It, it does not mean in any way, and should not be confused with the fact that somehow, because we were uh, in an institution that was so uh, strongly European in its uh, uh, um, composition, in terms of its faculty and student body, it doesn't mean uh, that it was somehow an institution that indoctrinated us <laughs> into being European. Uh, uh, but it meant that the ethos of the institution, its diversity, uh, the intellectual and cultural exchanges that were naturally uh, uh, um, the result and the product of that diverse uh, but strongly European student and faculty body uh, uh, really made me feel much more European on the subjects uh, that I discussed and, and became interested on, on the perspective that it often on to me on things, a perspective that was no longer framed only by my national experience, but that started to be framed to by the input that was brought to me by professors and students coming from other European countries in a variety of ways that was what made of me uh, more strongly European. I would say uh, one, the financial crisis of 2011 uh, and the extent to which it highlighted uh, a gap in the European Union between uh, the level of economic and social interdependence that we already have and the inadequacy of the level of political integration that we have to match that level of economic and social integration. 
What I mean by this is the fact that that crisis required a lot of answers to be developed at the European Union level, but it was very difficult to develop those uh, uh, answers because the politics of Europe is strongly shaped by national political forums that still uh, um, insufficiently incorporate that interdependence and therefore generate wrong political incentives for the actions of the national political levels and make it very difficult to coordinate uh, uh, those different national political preferences at the European Union level. And therefore, it instead of highlighting the need for transnational solutions in some respect and the need for stronger cooperation and joint action on the part of, at the European Union level, in many respects helped to pass a view of European integration as a zero-sum game between uh, uh, member states, a false understanding of what the European in integration process is, in my view, uh, but an understanding that was deeply prejudicial for the European Union and therefore, in my view, one of the worst moments. The other one has to be Brexit. Uh, 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 by definition, because it puts into question this idea that was not a legal uh, uh, binding principle, but it was more important than that. It was uh, part of what we thought had become our cultural understanding. Has Europeans that are also citizens of a state that somehow to be part of Europe uh, was forever. Uh, the idea that that is no longer the case, the idea that uh, the process of European integration is no longer irreversible has to be considered as an existential moment uh, uh, and one that therefore puts an existential threat to the European uh, Union. I would have to say that uh, um, with all the difficulties uh, with all the time delay, the answer that the European Union has been able to provide to the pandemic and to COVID. Uh, if you think about the European Union has no competence in the health area, and still it has managed, for example, to provide uh, uh, vaccines and to support its member states in acquiring vaccines, vaccines, and to do it in a way that is fair, balanced, and is equal to all the member states. Uh, access to vaccines could have become in the European Union something that will uh, uh, um, stress uh, differences between member states, discrimination between member states, and between the citizens of those member states. And instead, that has not been so. The European Union has been able to develop with its member states a collective answer, and one that is, uh, that is far from per perfect, but at least protects the idea that on the one hand, we are having more access and more easier access because of the European Union, and, and we are having more equal, balanced, and fair access uh, to citizens in all member states because we have the European Union and also the capacity to develop a, a, a strong economic response and support to its member states. Instead of the division, the risks with moral hazard, uh, the mutual blame uh, 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 that we saw unfairly on different sides in 2011, uh, uh, with those that uh, the debtor states that in need of help uh, not understanding the extent to which they were being helped by the other member states and the extent to which that required from them to show some level of discipline and commitment to reforms, but also on the parts of those that were helping and providing financial assistance, also, also misunderstanding the extent to which the crisis was a collective crisis that required that help. But instead of that, those divisions and tensions that we saw in 2011, 
the answer that the European Union was able to provide to the economic emergency side of the pandemic crisis is one that, in my view, uh, uh, puts in place mechanisms that will be useful to support the legitimacy of the European Union in all its member states in the future. Basically, it has defined my academic career to a large extent. I would have uh, I would have been a different academic if it was not the European Union, both in what I will be researching and what will be the subject of my intellectual interest. Uh, uh, but the fact that I studied European uh, law, European constitutional law and constitutional theory aspects through that, and that I studied it in the European context, and that allowed me to do a thesis and then a book that uh, gained international recognition, offered me an international academic career that perhaps I would not have had if it was not uh, for, for that. So I think that my academic career, the fact that I have an international academic career, to some extent, I owe it to uh, uh, the European uh, Union. So in in a very personal uh, sense, that's perhaps what I have to thank more Europe uh, for. Uh, of course, as a European citizen, I can tell you, as everybody can tell you, that we can uh, and owe a lot to the European Union, mobility, more choices of products as a consumer, all that. But I think that uh, uh, the, in a very, very personal uh, uh, way, perhaps in a way that is not the case with many other people, with many other citizens, the European Union has profoundly shaped my life. I would like uh, the European Union to do something that actually is the new book I'm working on, that is to help uh, protect and rescue national democracies. Uh, I believe that national democracies face a variety of challenges, uh, both as to a gap between uh, uh, the scope of politics that is still profoundly na national and the level of interdependence that we have that in many respects uh, uh, moves beyond our state, but also regarding the way politics takes place today the increased emotional dimension of politics instead of a rational element of uh, democratic deliberation. That, and I believe that in several of those respects, several of those aspects, the European Union can actually help save and protect national democracies because it can help to rationalize national democratic deliberation processes it can help to bring in and the control instances of power that are no longer controllable by national democratic processes. It can help correct the gap between the scope of politics being national and the scope of economic and, and social interdependence no longer being exclusively national. In all those respects, the European uh, Union can help correct problems that national democracies face and can therefore help correct them and save them. And it can also help in saving uh, 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 the gap of effectiveness that national democracies also have. The democracies legitimate themselves uh, uh, in, through inputs, uh, the way democratic procedures take, break, take place, but also through, through outputs, through what they offer in terms of solutions to people's problems. And many of these solutions today require transnational answers that only the European Union can help member states to develop and offer their citizens. So I think that in all those different ways, the European Union can actually be the protector and the saver in some respects of uh, national democracies, as paradoxically as that may sound, 
And that's what I hope from it until 2030. Um, no, I, I, I don't think, I mean, it depends what you mean by sovereignty. I think it certainly doesn't erode the sovereignty, the democratic sovereignty of uh, 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 EU citizens. It might erode in some respects the power of their member states, but the erosion of the powers of member states can come because the European Union actually empowers those citizens. And in some instances, empowering citizens means empowering them against their member states or against some member states. Uh, um, in order for citizens to be empowered with uh, the freedom to be mobile throughout the European Union, to decide where they want to go and study, to freely choose, even in some respects, where they want to benefit from health services, for example, that requires imposing limits on what national governments can do. Uh, is that an erosion of sovereignty? It depends on what is your understanding of sovereignty. For me, sovereignty is not uh, a good in its, state sovereignty is not a good in itself. State sovereignty is an instrument of popular sovereignty, of the sovereignty of the people. But the sovereignty of the people in some respects nowadays, that is a democratic self-government of of the people, of citizens nowadays, in some areas and in some respects, may be more strongly safeguarded uh, 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 by empowering European Union level of decisions and by putting lim limits on what states can do through European Union rules, than uh, 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 by recognizing the authority of states to shield themselves from rules that moreover, in many respects, they have jointly agreed at the European Union level. And I think that is the role of the court. What happens is that often people have that perception of the European Court of Justice because they say, well, the European Court of Justice has annulled and strike down many more measures of the state than it has done so with regard to EU measures. But that is easily understandable because most of the rules that the court has to interpret and apply are, are rules that govern the actions of its member states in order to guarantee the, the rights of EU citizens throughout the European Union and its internal market. And, 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 and you have to and take into account that when the court reviews, for example, the actions of European Union institutions, is often reviewing decisions that internally have already a very high level of checks and balances and control mechanisms. That is, when decisions require unanimity between member states, or strong qualified majority. And in addition to that, they require a proposal of the Commission and the agreement of the European Parliament. The political process within the European Union provides already so many safeguards and so many limits and constraints on the exercise of EU power that is natural that uh, uh, when a court is called in to review those measures, is often deferential to a political process that within itself has already so many mechanisms of, of, of control. I'm sure that if the EU decision-making system will be much easier, if it will be much easier to adopt legislation in the European Union, and it will be by simple majority that the Court of Justice will necessarily be much more active and, uh, and much stricter in the review, for example, of the boundaries on the exercise of powers by the European uh, Union. So one has to understand what the court does in light of how the EU political process itself works. Soft power is leading by example, uh, um, uh, is embedding a certain set of values into the policies of the European Union and and by the international statements that it takes, uh, and by the coordinated action of its uh, uh, member, member states. Of course, the more the union is divided, the more the union is polarized, the more the uh, fundamental values of the European Union are no longer perceived as being shared and, uh, uh, and acted on within the EU union itself, the less credible uh, is 
the international uh, uh, image of the European Union, and the less effective is its soft power. So yes, I believe that the increased polarization within the European Union, the increased erosion of an, a common understanding regarding certain fundamental values uh, endangers uh, the effectiveness of the European Union soft power. It's very simple, yes. It's problematic, yes. There needs to be a, a deeper sense of belonging. Uh, um, we know uh, uh, that in, uh, we know that the level of economic and social interdependence that we have requires deeper political uh, integration. Um, contrary to what is often the, the uh, thought, uh, the need for political integration doesn't result so much from a previous identity but results from the existence of inter interdependence is where you are interdependent that you need political mechanisms to regulate that interdependence to regulate the collective goods that uh, are rendered necessary by that interdependence to regulate the social conflicts that result from that interdependence, the externalities that result from that interdependence. But at the same time, and therefore, it is the paradox is that you need more political integration the more you have interdependence with diversity. But at the same time is where you have more uh, uh, identity that it's easier to develop political integration. And this is the, 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 this is the tension in the process of European integration. And that's why uh, 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 in order for the level of economic and social integration that we have and from which we benefit so much in the quality of life that it offers to be sustainable, we need to develop a stronger uh, uh, um, element uh, of loyalty towards the European Union. Uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, that loyalty, from my point of view, and that or that sense of identity needs to be developed uh, in some ways, not focusing only, only on, uh, uh, on rights, but also on duties. One, perhaps it has been a mistake of the European Union to legitimate itself uh, with regard to its citizens only by highlighting the rights that it brings to citizens. Perhaps it should highlight the duties that come with it too. Uh, and that's why I've been arguing, for example, for the need of taxation at the European Union level. Uh, if, if that taxation is linked to the economic activity where we are interdependent, it will help actually help to signal to citizens uh, uh, the consequences of that economic interdependence and therefore hopefully uh, uh, help strengthen that identity. Uh, uh, the examples I mentioned before of where the European Union, for example, can reinstate tax fairness, for example, with respect to digital companies, uh, uh, that member states on themselves can no longer do, it's a good example of an area where the European Union can act in such a way as to develop a sense of identity and to strengthen the identity that is necessary, in my view, for the process of European integration to be more sustainable in the medium long term. Those resentments are a consequence uh, not of European integration itself, but of flaws on how the policies of the European Union are designed. And they are designed in such a way that they promote a false understanding of the process of European integration. They promote a zero sum understanding that is false. So let me give you one example that has to do with the financial transfers that you, you were talking about. If you organize the revenues of the European Union and the financing of the European Union through contributions by the national budgets, 
you are conveying to European citizens an idea that somehow what the European Union does is to get money from some member states and then distribute that money to other member states. So that the European Union is getting money from uh, uh, rich states and giving them to poorer states. Uh, instead, the money that the European Union gets, uh, it's well below the wealth that the process of economic integration generates itself. The European Union distributes among its member states much less money than the money that is actually created by the process of European integration itself. So if instead of uh, uh, organizing the European Union resources in that way, you organize European resources by collecting those resources, by collecting the revenues from the economic activity itself, for example, from uh, 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 digital companies, that, can all, that do not pay uh, almost any taxes at the national level, uh, you will be conveying a very different notion to European Union citizens. If you will do it that way, citizens will perceive actually the process of financing of the European Union as correcting a tax unfairness that their member states can no longer effectively correct.